Well, I'll read today's passage and then we'll kind of work our way through it. So Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 38, it says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. And so in this section of Matthew's gospel, Jesus is continuing this series of confrontations with the Pharisees, the religious leaders in his day. And four times in the passage we just read, Jesus talks about sadness or talks with sadness about this generation or this evil generation. He's addressing the generation in his day. And these are people who had all of the spiritual resources that they needed to be able to recognize Jesus as God among us when he came to be among us. But instead, they rejected him. And this was how things were to work out throughout history, that that generation of the nation of Israel would, as a whole, reject Jesus. And then as a result, the gospel would go out to the Gentiles and the whole world would be blessed through Jesus. Romans 11, 11 and 12 talk about how that was the plan behind all this. So this was a unique time in history. There were unique things going on in that generation that don't necessarily repeat themselves in our day. But what always repeats itself is the human heart doing what human hearts do. Because we too, for some of the same reasons, hear from Jesus and then reject him. And sometimes we we read the Bible and we try to find ourselves in these stories and see which part we would play. But pretty often we can assume that I would have been one of the good guys in this story. I would have been with Jesus and his disciples. I wouldn't have been part of the generation that rejected Jesus. But we shouldn't assume that because the vast majority of people in his day, even when Jesus came to be among them, the vast majority rejected Jesus. They didn't respond to him the right way. And so, so we'll look at some of the reasons that they were rejecting Jesus, and we'll try to be honest with ourselves about whether the same things happen in our hearts. So walking through this passage, verse 38, it says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Now this seems like a really strange request, given the fact that the Pharisees were currently in a tussle with Jesus over the miracles he had been performing. Like they were seeing the signs. Jesus had cast out a demon. He healed a man with a withered hand, but he did it on the Sabbath. They weren't the signs that they wanted. They weren't done the way that they wanted. So they were seeing things, but it didn't measure up to their expectations. And so they say, we want to see a sign from you. But just in these last four chapters, Jesus has raised the dead, cured the blind, healed the mute, healed a man with a withered hand. So he's done plenty of stuff to show that there was real power in him. That's why the Pharisees had to make up an excuse that Jesus had real power, but they said, well, he only does it through the power of Satan. There's there's a power there that we can't deny, but it must be satanic. It must be coming from somewhere. So he was doing the signs. They knew there were signs. They knew there were miracles, and they couldn't deny the power of them. And now they come up to Jesus and again ask for a sign. And so Jesus refuses because Jesus knows their hearts. They've already explained away everything. They've explained away him raising the dead. What else is he going to do to actually confirm his authenticity to them? If he raises the dead and they say, no, we still don't think you're legit, is he going to come up with like a really clever card trick or something that's going to amaze them and finally say, we know you must be the Messiah. We know you must be. They're not going to accept any evidence anyway, so he's not going to do tricks for them. Not only that, but Jesus just isn't some kind of circus performer. He came on the scene and he did real miracles, but his miracles weren't to impress. They weren't to jump through the Pharisees' hoops. They were to bring real healing and show what his kingdom is really like. 
In fact, all of Jesus's miracles, they were done not to perform, but to bless. And it's one thing to go to God to ask him to intervene in a situation with a real blessing. It's another thing to test him and say, perform for me, and then I'll believe you. Do, do some things for me, and then I'll be on your team. Again and again, we see Jesus responding to humble pleas, but not to demands that he put on a show. And so the Pharisees here are trying to impose their own standards on God. He's got to do just the right grade of miracle on demand at just the right time, put on the show that we want. And if he doesn't, then he's not legit. And we'll just remain in our position of the keepers of the truths about the God of Israel. So verse 39, it says, but he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So Jesus says that the request that they're making here shows that they're adulterous. So why adulterous? Well, it's because they're cheating on God. They're desiring something other than the God that they should have been devoted to. They're desiring a show and something spectacular, and here's God walking among them, and they're rejecting him. It's almost like they have this idea that there must be something more than they're seeing in Jesus as he walks among them. It's like they have a wandering eye here. They actually believe that something more and better than Jesus exists. And so they want to be wowed and entertained to faith in Jesus. They want something other than him. And again, these are things that happened in a unique time in history, but this is certainly a warning to our generation of Christians in our day as well. Because at times we can say, Jesus, if you do certain things for me, then I'll believe and follow you. But if you don't measure up to my expectations, you don't answer my prayers how I wanted, then I'm not going to be on your team anymore. We kind of set ourselves up as the judges of Jesus. In an interview this past March, Kanye West, who, who previously was releasing worship albums and hosting worship services in the desert, talking up the value of expository preaching, he, he said this in the interview in March, he said, I have my issues with Jesus. There's a lot of stuff I went through that I prayed, and I didn't see Jesus show up. And his response to that is, and you can't tell me who I am, I'm the God of me. And he's just one example of this thing that we could all drift toward, where, where we judge Jesus by whether or not he meets our standards and does what I want. And, and if I can judge him like that, then for sure, I'm saying the same thing that Kanye says here, that I'm the God of me. I'm sitting in the judge's seat. I'm the God of this system. And so whether it's the Pharisees or Kanye West or us, we have this human tendency to put ourselves in that judgment seat to evaluate God and judge him. Or, like the Pharisees, we might demand just the right show before we'll ever respond to him. And this is something we have to be cautious of because I know that leaders in, in many churches in our day have come to believe that if our church services aren't perfectly produced pieces of Christian entertainment, then the people will not listen when we talk about Jesus or they won't stick around when we, when we talk about Jesus. So we have to give just the right show so that they'll stick around and then open their hearts up to him. And now certainly we're called to do everything our hand finds to do with all of our might and to cultivate excellence, even in our services and our music and things like that. So it's not like some excuse if we wanted to be lazy. But sometimes rather than aiming for excellence and simplicity, we can start to aim for impressing people, wowing them with the show. And what often happens is because of the law of diminishing returns, the show isn't enough, so you have to push it further and add more theatrical elements and do more show, and eventually you run out of what you could possibly do. And then often those same people who were demanding the show get bored and leave anyway because you can't stimulate them any further. And so we can be very show-seeking people. We can even kind of demand that unless you couch the message of Jesus in just the right show, we won't listen. And Jesus says that that can be a way of cheating on God. It's not really seeking Jesus, it's seeking Christian entertainment as opposed to that personal devotion to Christ. And now I'm all for Christians making good Christian entertainment, making good art. I think those are good things that we're called to do. But if we start to demand a show before we'll respond to Jesus, we're being just like the Pharisees. 
So they come demanding a sign, and Jesus says, no sign will be given except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. Okay, what's that? Well, verse 40, he says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You can read Jonah's story in the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. He was the Old Testament prophet that God called to go to minister to the Ninevites. And the Ninevites were not Israelites. They were Assyrians. They were known to the Israelites, at least, as violent people. They were enemies of the nation of Israel. They were this neighboring threat to Israel. So the people in Israel did not like them, including Jonah. He didn't like them either. And God comes to Jonah and calls him to go preach to them. So Jonah says, no, not them. And he hops on a ship headed in the polar opposite direction across the Mediterranean to Tarshish, possibly in southern Spain. And and as he goes, God disciplines Jonah. He sends storms. And then the sailors throw Jonah overboard where a great fish swallows him up. And he's in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. I know some people read that story and, and try to like scientifically explain it by saying, you know, this actually does happen sometimes. This one time in 1815, this one guy got swallowed by a fish and he lived. And, and while that may very well be true, I think the point of the book of Jonah is God's doing this miraculously. So we don't necessarily need the scientific explanation for it. That Jonah is being sustained alive, but he is very much as close to death as you can be without dying. He even talks in Jonah chapter 2 about being in Sheol. He's, he's in the belly of a sea monster. And so, so that's really as close to death as you can get without actually being there. But God keeps him alive. He's vomited out. And then the fact that God brought him back from that certain death was a sign to the people of Nineveh that he had been sent by God. And then despite his total lack of enthusiasm for this missions trip that God sent him on, the people of Nineveh, who are total pagans, repent. And Jesus says, that's the only sign that I'm going to give you. He says that just like Jonah was three days and three nights in in the heart of that fish, I'll be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That Jesus would soon be crucified. And he wouldn't just come near to death, he would die. He'd be buried in the earth, and three days later he would rise from the dead, just like Jonah, or God brought Jonah out of his near-death experience. God would bring Jesus from true death, and the resurrection of Jesus then would be the sign to that generation and all generations to follow that Jesus was who he said he was. Verse 41, he says, The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So Jesus says that those people from Nineveh who had no previous allegiance to God, no knowledge of God's word, no temple, no prophets, all they had was Jonah, they had no other reason to believe, they repented and believed. And and he says that one day they're going to rise up and look at this generation of Pharisees who have it all, who have the temple, who have the Bible, who have the prophets, who have every reason to believe. And the Ninevites will judge this generation because with far fewer signs, far fewer resources, no show at all, they believed. I mean, if you think about Jonah, he was probably the worst missionary in all of history. Like, I can't imagine if our church was supporting a missionary who was anything like Jonah, who, who, you know, he writes to us in his first email and he says, God definitely called me to go minister to the Ninevites very clearly. I know that's his will, but I hate those people. So there's no way that I'm going there, uh, but southern Spain is lovely, so I'm going to head in that direction and get a house on the med, maybe do some ministry there. I appreciate your support checks. Like, if we got that email, he's not our guy. And then imagine if the next month he emails again and says, well, unfortunately, God arranged the circumstances so that I have to go to the Ninevites, so I'll do it. I'm going to go and do my job minimally. I'm going to go and basically phone it in. I'll just walk into that crowd of Ninevites, and I'm going to preach what in the original was a five-word sermon and say, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. I'm going to check the box. I'm going to obey. I'm going to do it because I have to do it because otherwise I don't want to mess with another fish. So he goes and, and does that. And then his email month three says, bad news. They believed and converted. (laughs) 
And now I'm super frustrated because God's not going to be destroying them now. And my favorite thing in the world, my little shade tree, my one comfort in life just got eaten by a worm and now I don't have shade. I hate missionary life. Like we'd be like, this is, this is our missionary. And that's the actual story. Like you can read about it in, in Jonah. He was totally self-centered. He didn't love the people. He wanted God to judge the people he was preaching to. He wouldn't have gone to them if it weren't for the fish. He was really upset when they converted. What missionary is like that? But the point is, with that one zero enthusiasm, phoning it in prophet preaching to them, the Ninevites repented. He comes and preaches a five-word sermon, and they're in tears going, what must we do to be saved? Like, we, we need, we, we want to turn. And now here comes Jesus to the Pharisees. They've got the Bible, the temple, the resources. They've got everything. And Jesus comes with this tsunami of truth, massive miracles, truth blasted out of a cannon. Jesus loves these people. He weeps over them on a number of occasions. He's compassionate and kind. He never sins himself. His teaching resonates with them as true and life-changing. He's done the miracles so that the people who have their Bibles can check all the boxes and see that he's the one. And they say, I don't know, do, do some more tricks for us. And those pagan Ninevites repented. But here are these good religious people too hung up on themselves to repent when Jesus shows up among them. So he says, Nineveh's gonna judge y'all because I'm so much greater than Jonah and they repented at his preaching. Then he uses another example, verse 42. He says, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. And so Jesus, again, goes to another Old Testament story. This one's in 1 Kings 10. And it's the story where the queen of Sheba, or the queen of the south, heard that, that Solomon was wise and heard that Solomon was rich. And she was reigning over a territory that was probably in, in Yemen and then across the sea in Ethiopia. And she puts together this huge caravan of people to travel across the known world so that she can learn from the wisdom of Solomon. And she sits with Solomon and he answers every question she throws at him with the wisdom of the Lord. She sees his wealth. She sees his prosperity. She sees all that he's accomplishing in Israel. And she says, I had heard that this was a big deal. And it was such a big deal. I put together this caravan to get here, but I didn't know the half of it. So she, she seeks out wisdom at great cost to herself. She finds that wisdom. And then as the story goes, she moved back home and taught her whole nation the ways of the God of Israel. And then outside the Bible, there's a lot of folklore that's attached to her that may or may not be true. A lot of it probably made up. I mean, even stories about her becoming one of Solomon's wives and having his son who reigned over a Solomonic dynasty in Ethiopia. And it's probably mostly folklore in, in that part. But what the Bible clearly teaches is, is that she was a queen over a great territory, traveled at great cost to herself to seek out wisdom. And when she found it, she was amazed. But here's the thing with Solomon, like the guy had his faults. Toward the end of his life, he was worshiping other gods. He had ego connected to his wealth. He taught a, a lot of wisdom, truly inspired by God. But he personally was far from a perfect man. But now Jesus busts on the scene. Far greater than Solomon. There's not an ounce of selfishness in him. Jesus won't even turn stones into bread to benefit himself. He came only and always to serve. He came with greater wisdom, greater purity, greater power than Solomon. But instead of seeking out his wisdom, the Pharisees reject it. And so Jesus says, someday the Queen of Sheba is going to rise up and judge this generation. Because she went across the world to find Solomon and you've got a greater than Solomon right in your backyard and you don't care at all about the wisdom that I'm giving you. The queen of the south would have loved to have had someone greater than Solomon right there in her neighborhood with no massive desert trek necessary to learn from him. But she did everything she possibly could to get wisdom. And here's wisdom personified living among them and they don't respond. And this, again, is a warning to us in our generation. We have so much. We have access to Jesus. 
We have access to the Bible in English, which we take for granted, but something that William Tyndale was burned at the stake to, to, to preserve for us. We have wisdom galore. We have theological libraries in our pockets. We have access to so much, and it's right in our backyard. But still sometimes flippantly, we'll walk away from the faith, not really seek wisdom at all, but give ourselves to trivialities and say, well, that's just not for me. So then Jesus goes on and he tells a little story about a demon. And, and most of our Bibles probably have this demarcated as a separate section, but those, those sections were not in the original. Those came later. And it seems like this is all part of one section because there's this one main flow of thought where Jesus talks about this generation. And so in this section, he's continuing to talk about this evil generation. And he, he tells this what seems like a little parable of an exorcism. And so verse 43, he says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person... It passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. And you think, okay, what is he talking about here? Like, what, what, what's he getting at? And I think the last sentence in this section makes sense of it. He says, so also will it be with this evil generation. So he's not necessarily giving us a theology of like exorcisms here. He's talking about what's going on with that evil generation. So, so here's this person with all kinds of problems, possessed by a demon. And then the demon gets cast out and that person's life gets put in order. But it's empty. Nobody has occupied the place. The demon, meanwhile, is looking for a place to live, and with interest rates being what they are, he can't afford a place, so he moves back home. He finds that it's been swept. It's nice, and so he brings seven of his friends to come in and throw a party, and they trash the place, and then Jesus says, that's how it's going to be with this generation. Okay, so what, what's he saying? Well, that generation, like any generation, definitely wanted to see things fixed and put in order. They knew that they had problems that they wanted to see solved. There was sickness that they wanted cured. There were demon possessions. There was evil. There was death. They wanted someone to come and set all of that in order. And so Jesus is coming and he's doing that. It's like he's casting out that demon left and right. He's putting things in order. He's showing people what life under his reign is like. And there's good fruit coming as he does all these miracles. But when Jesus comes, you get the whole Jesus. He doesn't just come to to clean up and fix our problems. He comes to rule and reign. He comes as a king. And so the right response of the people in that day should have been to welcome Jesus as the rightful king. You've cleaned up the house. Now occupy it. Fill this space up with your rule and your reign. He cast out the demon, so now he should come and live in that place. But they reject Jesus. They like the effects of Jesus. They just don't want to submit to the rule of Jesus. But evil abhors a vacuum, and something is going to, to, to come in and run this place. They want Jesus to clean it up, but not to run it, not to occupy it. They would just assume have all the effects of Jesus, but not Jesus himself. They want the fruit, but not the tree. But in the end, that'll make things far worse. In, in our day, likewise, we, we certainly, as a culture, we would love to see many of the fruits of Christian belief become prevalent in our culture. I mean, everybody wants crime to go down. Everybody wants there to be more kindness and grace between neighbors. Hard work is, is something that's important. Excellent education for our kids. Power only being used to serve those without it. People rejecting envy, strong families, lasting marriages, low taxes because people are so generous with one another that less help is needed, shrinking levels of addiction. We all want those fruits that would come from widespread Christian belief. We all want those demons cast out. We want those effects of Christianity. But Jesus doesn't just come to give us his effects. He comes to give us himself. He doesn't just come to to sort things out in our house. He comes to rule. He comes to occupy if we'll have him at all. 
And so we live in a culture that wants the fruits of Christianity but rejects the rule of Jesus. I know I've read this quote a million times, but it's just just so appropriate for us. C.S. Lewis in Abolition of Man says, in a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. So it's like we want all kinds of Christian things to happen, but not Christ. We want his benefits, but not his reign. We want improvements, but not Jesus as Lord. But the truth is, we all worship something. There will be a God that we worship. Something's going to come in and fill that place. It's not a matter of whether we worship a God, but it's a matter of which God or gods we worship. There's always someone that reigns. That house doesn't stay unoccupied for a long time, but only Jesus is good. Only Jesus is worthy of reigning. And he's not going to come and just do tricks for us. He certainly comes to all who call out to him, but he comes on his terms. Yes, to bless. But also part of his blessing is his good reign over us. We all have a God. It's not whether, but which. Something reigns. And there is no better king than Jesus. So if you haven't yet submitted to his reign, I mean, consider who he is. I mean, you have Jonah, who doesn't even love the people that he goes to preach to. Jesus comes perfectly loving, so loving that he lays down his life and gives it for those who, while we are still sinners, who's like Jesus? He's perfectly wise where every word that he speaks is true, and he only speaks the things that the Father gives him to speak. He's perfectly just, calling out sin and unbelief and knowing the heart. But he's also perfectly merciful, giving his own life to go and die and pay for sin. And then if we say, how do I know that I can believe that it's true? He gave us the sign of the prophet Jonah. He rose from the dead. And while he doesn't perform on our terms, in our deepest need, Christ has already provided the ultimate solution. So trust in him. He's worthy of it. And Christians, let's consider whether we are becoming like the Pharisees who are demanding signs from God, where we want just the right amount of health and success and miracles instead of accepting the sign that's been given, that Jesus rose from the dead. And I know that that we're weak and we're struggling and we want to see something tangible. We want to touch something. We want to experience something. One of the things that God gave us to see and touch and experience is some bread and wine as visible signs of his grace. These elements, the Lord's Supper, that we'll take together as Christians physically display what the Bible teaches us about the gospel. And the gospel of Jesus is, is the message that he promises us forgiveness of sins, everlasting life, pardon from all we've done because his body was torn and his blood was spilt. The gospel says that he went to that cross as our substitute and gave his life so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so if we're looking for something to hold and taste and touch that that represents it to us, that's what the Lord's Supper is. It's sometimes called the word of God made visible. And this simple observance is the thing that he's given for our eyes to see to build our faith. And it's not anything spectacular. It doesn't cost much. It's not a big show. It's not perfectly designed to impress us. It just preaches the truth of who he is. In fact, it helps us to avoid some of the pressure that we feel, either in our personal devotion lives or in our church services, this pressure that we feel to almost make something happen, to make God show up in tangible ways, to manufacture some kind of emotional experience that will will prove that he's around or maybe make a show that will make him show up. But the good news that we preach to ourselves as we take the Lord's Supper is that we couldn't make God's presence among us happen. But by his grace, he made himself known to us and he decided to be known how he would be known, not how we drummed him up. We couldn't get to him through our efforts. We couldn't ascend to heaven to draw him down. So he came to us in Christ and gave his life 
and drew near to us. And when he came, he came not in the hype, but he comes to us today in that still small voice of scripture, not in the storm and the smoke and the mirrors, but Jesus and all of his benefits are preached to us through the bread and the wine. Nothing's more ordinary than this. But it's there that God makes his word visible to us. It's where he reminds us and assures us of Christ's sacrifice for us. And so if you're a Christian here today who has trusted in Jesus and his cross and that alone for your forgiveness of sins, you've confessed all of your known sins, we invite you to take this this supper with us. But if you're here today and you don't yet believe those things, you don't believe that Jesus did those things or haven't confessed your known sin, we would encourage you not to take this supper and deny the thing that you're saying with, with your body, with your life. So as we prepare to take this Lord's Supper, to show the Lord's death till he comes, to preach the gospel again to our hearts, to remind us of the ultimate thing, let's take a moment now just in silence and, and silently pray and confess our sins to the Lord.